Well, thank you very much, and thank you, Keith. I want to commend Judge Trufer as a longstanding member of the Maryland Bar for finding an opening speaker who would not charge us to be here today. So I hope we get our money's worth. But there is no place like home, and I can't tell you how grateful I am to be back home in Maryland with so many friends. When my 14-year-old daughter learned that I was going to be Deputy Attorney General, she asked me whether I would get my picture in the newspaper. <laughs> because you know, that's very important when you're 14 years old. And I said, no. <laughs> I told her Deputy Attorney General is a low-profile job. Nobody knows the Deputy Attorney General. But I was mistaken. She likes to tell me I was wrong about that. Uh, but fortunately, I actually was one of the few people who did know most former Deputy Attorneys General. The position carries a duty to defend legal principles in a town that runs by political principles. You need to make controversial decisions, often under exigent circumstances and with limited information. And then critics get unlimited time to critique what you did and tell you how they would have done it better. <laughs> One of my predecessors offered me some wise advice. He said, you'll never be more popular in this job than on your first day. I want to read to you a few excerpts from a newspaper story about the Department of Justice. Quote, the FBI director did not heed the Attorney General's advice. The FBI deputy director has been suspended pending an investigation of his conduct. The department was adrift. One of the three top department officials resigned in disgrace. Justice was battered by congressional inquiries into its handling of significant cases. Now, those critiques may sound familiar, but every one of those comments is from a newspaper story printed in 1995. It's about the Clinton administration. But when I accepted the job, I knew that it would not come with fair winds and following seas. I was the 37th Deputy Attorney General, and the position has existed for 67 years. The median tenure is just 16 months. The record for shortest tenure was set by William Ruckelshaus. He resigned after one month when President Nixon ordered him to fire a special prosecutor. Phil Hyman, who was a friend of mine, left after 10 months because of irreconcilable differences with his Attorney General, Janet Reno. Paul McNulty made it to the average of 16 months, and then he stepped down after his congressional testimony about the reasons for firing U.S. attorneys turned out to be incorrect. Now, none of those things happened on my watch. <laughs> Some people expected the special counsel to be fired or the deputy to lose his job over differences with the Attorney General, the Congress or someone else in Washington. <laughs> but none of those things happened. But other things did happen. Less than two weeks after I was sworn in, a friend from Maryland sent me an urgent text message. He said, you need to get out of there immediately. <laughs> now the truth is, I always expected my tenure in government to be short. My first job in 1990 paid less than half of what private law firms were paying. And that salary gap grew every year. I thought my paycheck had finally caught up to first year law firm associates last year, but it turns out that the big firms are paying new lawyers more than the deputy attorney general earns. So financial compensation is not the main attraction for Department of Justice lawyers. The noble mission and the honorable colleagues are what motivated me to stay. As a young lawyer, I personally conducted investigations involving a senator, a president, and a first lady. I prosecuted a governor and federal judges, police officers and murderers, rapists and drug dealers, contractors who paid bribes, and government officials who accepted bribes. In 1996, I was co-counsel on a three-month trial that occupied the television news and newspaper front stories for three months, almost every day. It was a case against the governor of Arkansas for defrauding, <coughs> pardon me, for defrauding a savings and loan institution, which many of you know as the Whitewater Independent Counsel Investigation. President Clinton testified for the defense. We recorded his testimony at the White House and we played it for the jury in Little Rock. I also investigated allegations that Clinton White House officials wrongly obtained FBI background investigation reports about Republicans. I spent several weeks at the White House reviewing records and interviewing witnesses. Now, some people assumed in that case, which was known publicly as the FBI files matter, some people assumed that it was a criminal scheme involving the president, the first lady, or other senior White House officials, but the evidence showed that a low-level career employee had ordered the records by mistake. The supervisor was a political appointee 
who lacked relevant experience. That happens a lot in Washington. <laughs> there was poor management, but there was no evidence that warranted criminal prosecution. Now, I learned a few important lessons through my work on that and many other cases. First, the more complex a conspiracy theory, the less likely it is to be true. Sometimes a wacky conspiracy theory has a kernel of truth, but usually it doesn't pan out. Second, the evidence rarely matches the allegations reported through the media, which means that most people form erroneous impressions. News outlets can only report what they learn from sources who always have ulterior motives and limited information. Agents and prosecutors fortunately have resources and tools that empower them to get more complete and accurate information. Third, I learned that critics do not care about the evidence. They think they already know the truth. And fourth, prosecutors do not care what those critics say. And I want to elaborate on that fourth point today. When I became Deputy Attorney General, I selected portraits of former attorneys general to display outside my office. I chose based on principles, not politics. Most of them were Republicans, William Rogers, Edward Levy, and John Ashcroft. I also chose two Democrats. The first is Robert Jackson. Jackson delivered an inspiring speech in 1940 about the role of the federal prosecutor. He emphasized that the power to condemn and imprison American citizens should be exercised with humility and judgment. Jackson observed that sometimes political groups cry for the scalps of individuals because they do not like their views. He counseled prosecutors to remain dispassionate and courageous. Now, being dispassionate does not require us to be indifferent. Prosecutors are allowed to have political views. We just can't allow them to influence our deliberations about cases. Now, Jackson's reference to courage is telling. Sometimes it takes courage to prosecute a case. But Jackson was talking about a different kind of courage, the courage to disregard politics and decline prosecution when criminal enforcement is not the appropriate remedy. The second Democratic portrait outside my office depicts an attorney general better known to this audience, Baltimore's own Ben Civiletti. In 1980, Civiletti adopted the principles of federal prosecution, a set of guidelines to govern the exercise of discretion by federal prosecutors. The principles of federal prosecution instruct us to bring charges only if five conditions pertain. Number one, we believe the person's conduct constitutes a federal offense. Number two, the admissible evidence will probably be sufficient to obtain a conviction and sustain it on appeal. Number three, the prosecution will serve a substantial federal interest. We don't prosecute just because we can. And number four, the person is not subject to effective prosecution in another jurisdiction because we want to defer to our state and local partners when they can handle the case. And number five, there's no adequate non-criminal alternative to prosecution. Now by adequate, we mean something that would suffice to impose an appropriate penalty and establish an effective deterrent. But most partisan pundits stop at issue one. They support prosecution whenever they believe a political opponent has committed a crime. It's easy to accuse someone of a crime in a television studio it is not easy to prove it beyond any reasonable doubt in a court of law. But partisan pundits tend to evaluate cases solely in terms of the immediate impact on their political futures. They assume that if you indict a politician, you support the other party. And if you don't charge a politician, that means you must support his party. But good lawyers know that trying to infer partisan affiliation from law enforcement decisions is a category error. It uses the wrong frame of reference because we base our decisions on the evidence and the law. When I dealt with cases that had political significance, I sometimes asked, how would we handle this case if the political affiliations were reversed? For partisans, the answer is usually different, but for prosecutors, the answers must be the same. One of the issues that I dealt with over the past two years was the special counsel investigation of the 2016 election. You probably hear more than enough about that. The bottom line is that the special counsel stuck to the core mandate and completed the investigation in record time. It was a critical investigation. We needed to gather the facts as expeditiously as possible, and we did. As U.S. attorney in Baltimore, I worked three miles from my favorite national monument, Fort McHenry. In 1814, a Maryland lawyer named Francis Scott Key watched from a ship in the Chesapeake Bay as the Star Spangled Banner waved over the ramparts of the fort, 
during the Battle of Baltimore. Sometimes we need to fight to defend America, but soldiers are not our only guardians, and bombs are not our only threat. In 1941, when Germany was seeking to enslave Europe and Japan was preparing to attack America, Attorney General Robert Jackson spoke about the role of lawyers in protecting national security. He said, the ramparts that we watch are not only those on the outer borders, which are largely the concern of the military, there are also inner ramparts of our society, the Constitution, its guarantees, our freedoms, and the supremacy of law. These are yours to guard, and their protection is your national defense program. Free and fair elections are one of the ramparts of our society, and there was compelling evidence that Russian operatives had hacked American computers and defrauded American citizens in an effort to affect the 2016 election. And that was only the tip of the iceberg of a continuing strategy to foment social discord. It doesn't matter to me which side the Russians supported. They're not Republicans or Democrats. They're not trying to help America. And they're trying to undermine America. So as acting attorney general, it was my job to ensure that the Department of Justice responded appropriately by conducting an independent investigation, completing it expeditiously, holding criminals accountable if warranted, and working with our partner agencies to counter foreign agents, because the Department of Justice has a role now beyond law enforcement. We work with the intelligence community to deter foreign threats. As a result of the investigation, we identified the perpetrators. Our citizens are now better informed about covert foreign influence schemes, and our government is better prepared to confront them. But not everybody was happy with my decisions, in case you didn't notice. <laughs> Some people complained when we opened the special counsel investigation. Other people complained when we closed the investigation. Some people complained that we prosecuted anyone. Others complained that we didn't prosecute everyone. One woman approached me after an event last week. She said, you were my hero for two years while you ignored those threats and pressed forward with the investigation. But you ruined it by supporting the Attorney General when he decided not to indict the President. And I replied, do you think the President belongs in federal prison? And she said, no, I just want him held accountable. Well, my job was to conduct a fair and independent investigation and apply the principles of federal prosecution. I did my job. My new partisan critics share something in common with my old partisan critics. They refuse to accept that a rule of law system is about process and not just outcomes. One of the reasons I don't spend that much time talking about the election investigation is that it was really just a small part of my job, contrary to what you saw on television. The Deputy Attorney General supervises an agency with a $28 billion budget and 115,000 employees. We're responsible for all criminal and civil litigation throughout the country. Cases handled by all of our 93 United States attorneys and by seven litigating divisions of the Justice Department in Washington. The deputy is also responsible for supervising the law enforcement agencies in the Justice Department, ATF, DEA, FBI, and the Marshal Service, among other duties. I also met regularly with leaders of federal, state, and local law enforcement agencies and with the National Security Council, as well as with foreign officials. So most of my work had nothing to do with the election. Now, the job is rewarding, but it can be grueling. My 25-month tenure put me in, believe it or not, the top third in terms of deputy AG length of service. Two-thirds of the 37 deputies served less than two years. In April, I asked my wife to review my resignation letter and gave an effective date of May 11th. She said, do you think you should specify the year? <laughs> Just to eliminate any uncertainty. And while I have your attention, I want to discuss the role of lawyers in promoting civic virtues. And I think this is an appropriate audience filled with Maryland lawyers and uh, some prominent Maryland lawyers, our current Attorney General Brian Frosch, prior Attorney General Doug Gansler. You are the folks who set the tone for law in our state. Many people complain about the deterioration of civic discourse. I believe lawyers should take responsibility to set an example of civility and humility. And that's not a novel concept. In 1838, a young lawyer named Abraham Lincoln worried 
about sharp political divisions and rising passions in our young republic. Lincoln commented that the Revolutionary War had bound Americans together to confront a common enemy. He observed that confronting an existential threat causes people to set aside the negative aspects of human nature, but those destructive passions return when the threat recedes. These are Lincoln's words. The jealousy, envy, and avarice incident to human nature are so common to a state of peace and prosperity were for a time in a great measure smothered and rendered inactive. The deep-rooted principles of hate and the powerful motive of revenge, instead of being turned against our fellow citizens, were directed exclusively against the British. After the war, Lincoln maintained, memories of the battles and the passions of the founding era contributed to domestic peace for many decades. But then the war veterans and other members of the founding generation passed away. Now Lincoln described recent episodes of mob violence that demonstrated a lack of respect for the rule of law. He encouraged the audience to build public support for the law, particularly for the legal processes that we all enforce in our courts. Lincoln said, passion has helped us in the past. It will in the future be our enemy. Reason, cold, calculating, unimpassioned reason must furnish all the materials for our future, future support and defense. Now, Lincoln was an advocate of the rule of law uh, as a tool to settle disputes in society. Now, some people assume that lawyers foment controversy. Well, that's understandable. Have you heard the joke about a small town with just one lawyer who is suffering from a lack of business? Then a second lawyer moved to town and they both prospered. <laughs> it takes two to fight. So we tend to think of lawyers as warriors. The rhetoric of litigation is about disputes and battles, victory and defeat. There's a story about a man waiting anxiously to hear from his lawyer about the outcome of a case. He's awaiting the ruling from a judge and his lawyer sends him a message. Justice was done. And the client replies, appeal immediately. <laughs> Clients do not pay private lawyers to seek justice. They want to win. But our professional obligations set us apart from clients. Zealous advocacy is not our only duty. We share a responsibility to maintain the integrity of the courts and to foster public confidence in the judicial system. The ABA was so concerned about disreputable lawyers elevating zeal over the other ethical duties that it added this caveat to the rule. The lawyer's duty does not require the use of offensive tactics or preclude treating all persons with courtesy and respect. As Shakespeare counseled more than four centuries ago, good lawyers strive mightily in court, but eat and drink as friends. And that really is what bar association meetings like this are about. That's how lawyers are supposed to behave. The Maryland Bar Oath reads as follows. I will at all times demean myself fairly and honorably as an attorney and practitioner at law. It says at all times because we're all on the same team. Our politicians could benefit from a bit of that collegial spirit, <clears throat> but I'm not here to complain about politicians. Most politicians I met in Washington are decent people in real life. <laughs> Even some of those congressmen who act like bores on television are polite when the cameras are turned off. The trouble is that they're trapped in a culture that rewards excess. Most of them complain about it behind the scenes, but they do not know what to do about it. When I drove across the Chesapeake Bay last night, I thought of a parable about three sailors, a pessimist, an optimist, and a realist. The wind shifts and their ship goes off course. The pessimist fears that the wind will never change. The optimist hopes for it to change. The realist adjusts the sails. <laughs> American values do not flow down from politicians. Our values flow up from parents and teachers, friends and neighbors, doctors and lawyers, and other trusted role models. We control the sails. To paraphrase Thomas Jefferson, the manners and spirit of the people are what preserve the republic. And lawyers are uniquely positioned to convey the value of civility, logic, and law. Robert Jackson spoke about the fiduciary duty of lawyers, the obligation to serve as trustees for the public interest. He contrasted 
legal principles that we follow with what he referred to, this is in 1940, as the volatile values of politics. When facing attacks from legislators in the halls of Congress and pundits on the pages of newspapers, Jackson calmly explained, we must endure criticism because the moral authority of our legal process depends on the impartiality of lawyers. Maryland lawyers are well suited to fulfill that mandate. Some of you may be familiar with a book by Robert Bruger. He wrote a comprehensive history of Maryland about 20 years ago, in which he described our state as a place of middle temperament with a culture of sensibility founded on compromise and toleration. He said that Marylanders stand for moderation, skepticism, ironic humor, love of place, and a sense of proportion. That doesn't mean that we always agree about what to do. We have many political differences. What it means is that we agree about the need to find ways to work together. Most of us share those values. Most Americans share those values. And Maryland lawyers should exemplify them. I want to conclude with another sailing reference from the poet Edna Wheeler Wilcox. One ship drives east and another drives west with the selfsame winds that blow. Tis the set of the sails and not the gales that determine the way to go. Like the winds of the sea are the winds of fate as we voyage along through life. Tis the set of the soul that decides its goal and not the calm or the strife. We should all follow that advice. Don't waste time lamenting the unfair wind and praying for it to change. Adjust your own sails and help steer the ship in the right direction. Thank you very much. <laughs> With a deep thanks, deep, deep thanks to uh, uh, Rod Rosenstein for those terrific remarks. Uh, he has graciously agreed to extend his time here, gratis, uh, to uh, <laughs> much appreciated, uh, to take a few questions uh, from the crowd. So at this time, is there a microphone out there? Uh, Shout them out. Actually, there There's one. They're, they're right there. Yep. So with that, sure. Yes, sir. I can hear you. Yeah, I'm pleased to say that I'm blissfully unaware of that recent event. <laughs> As I was not following news this morning, I was preparing for this event, but uh, I was obviously involved in some of these issues when I was in the department, so it wouldn't be appropriate for me to comment on particular cases. On the general principle, though, uh, you know, all these issues can be worked out between Congress, the, the uh, executive branch, and the courts. Executive privilege obviously is a legitimate uh, recognized principle. It's something that we argue about in both Democratic and Republican administrations, but I, I regret that I, I don't know what happened this morning. I wouldn't be able to comment on that anyway. Yes, ma'am. Um, you you yep. I'll repeat the question. I don't think the mics are on. So. Yes. You know, it's interesting. We, as lawyers, actually, I think, don't feel all that much. Judges do, though, right? We have a lot of judges in the room. Judges are really in a similar position where they're not able... Actually, they're in a worse position than I was because I, I could fight back on occasion. Um, although it's funny, you know, people would sometimes say, why aren't you responding to all this criticism? And I say, well, you know, let's talk just about the House of Representatives. There are 435 of them. There's only one of me. I don't have time, and I've got a lot of other things to do. But you know, judges are in the same position, and they're not even allowed to respond when they're criticized. And uh, I think that the answer to that is you have to understand when you take the job, you're going you're gonna to face some of that uh, and try to ignore it. It's a lot harder to ignore today 
right? Once upon a time, we would say, well, just don't read the newspapers. You tell the jury, don't read the newspapers uh, so you won't be exposed, uh, or, or tell judges to ignore the news. Now it's impossible. I mean, you can't log on to a computer without seeing the latest headlines, right? So it's impossible to, to truly ignore it. But I do think you need to set it aside and, and recognize that uh, there are people who are in the business of criticism, and that's what they do for a living. I remember one day, there was some issue that was, uh, it happened in the morning, and as deputy AG, I gave you some sense of this. We, it's a very busy schedule. I typically would have meetings scheduled all day long, and occasionally I'd have an hour or so off for lunch. Uh, but I'd be, you know, going from issue to issue, and I came home and the television was on. First thing I would say is, turn it off. <laughs> but the television was on, and it was one of those shows with, you know, Hollywood Squares, all those commentators, everybody finding a different reason to critique the deputy attorney general. <laughs> And my wife asked me about you know, this issue, and you know, wasn't that a big deal? And I said, you know, really it wasn't. I mean, I did hear about it, but I had a full day of other things, and I couldn't afford to spend my time on that issue. As a matter of fact, the de deputy AG's office had a television on the wall. It's a very nice flat screen, and I think it was nice. I actually never turned it on. <laughs> I, I unplugged it. Uh, but, but it's impossible not to be exposed to it, and obviously we have public affairs uh, spokespeople, and their job is to keep abreast of those issues. So. I'd speak with them generally once a day, you know, what are the hot issues, what are people concerned about. Uh, but uh, the bottom line is you just have to know coming into these jobs that you're going to face that kind of criticism, and you do need to be psychologically prepared for it. You know, if you have a fragile ego, you do not want to be in one of these jobs in Washington. I'm sure Doug and Brian can, uh, can second that. Yes, sir. First. Adly <laughs> frame their own thoughts and questions for you. Uh, mine pertains to something that is the central theme that you were speaking of, and that is the application of the rule of law. And uh, having myself had the privilege and opportunity to work many years ago for one of President Nixon's enemies during the Watergate era, it concerns me tremendously whether or not all politicians, including the President of the United States, are subject. So the first part of the question is, do you think he was indictable as uh, an individual for obstruction of justice? And I know I'm putting you on the spot. And the second question is, if not, are you relying entirely on that Department of Justice opinion that a president, a sitting president, is not indictable? Because to my knowledge, the Supreme Court has never ruled directly on that issue. Certainly the Constitution is silent on the subject. And the closest I think the Supreme Court came to the issue was with President Clinton in the civil action where the court said that he was subject to being uh, part of the process involving the, uh, uh, the Paula Jones case and uh, had to sit for depositions, et cetera. And if the answer is you have to wait until a president is no longer in office, how do we explain the fact that until the 22nd Amendment was passed, the president could have served many, many terms and could have escaped prosecution entirely, particularly for crimes that have a statute of limitations. So I've, I've presented yeah. a lot. Yep, friend, no, sure. I appreciate it. Now, I, uh, you know, I don't talk about internal deliberations, but uh, the Attorney General did reveal that I concurred in his conclusion. Uh, in with regard to the what we refer to as volume two of the special counsel report, that is that the evidence set forth in the special counsel report would not warrant indictment. That, that's a discretionary determination. Somebody had to make that decision, and the attorney general ultimately is accountable for it, so he made it. But on the theoretical question of whether or not a president could be indicted, you know, that's an issue that the country would have to face uh, if we had a case where the attorney general determined that it was appropriate to indict the president, or hypothetically, an independent counsel. I worked for an independent counsel if the independent counsel had reached that uh, decision. Now, the guidance from the Department of Justice, which is actually bipartisan, Republican and Democratic administrations have reviewed these issues and have reached the same conclusion that uh, the president cannot be indicted. Now, that's the only decision that is reflected in those opinions of the Office of Legal Counsel, as I say, both by Republican and Democratic administrations. Uh, with regard to process, that is whether the president can be investigated, whether he can be subpoenaed, th those are all different issues. But the ultimate issue, it's a constitutional issue, as you say, it's not in the Constitution, like a lot of things aren't in the Constitution, including executive privilege, but the principle of it is 
that the president is the leader of the executive branch, and in theory, uh, you know, all the executive branch actions are taken uh, upon delegation of power by the president. But that's just a theoretical issue. Uh, if the issue were to arise, hypothetically, then whoever the attorney general is at the time would have to decide whether to respect that prior opinion or revisit it. But so far, every time the department has looked at it, they've reached that same conclusion. Yes, ma'am. That's a hard question for a couple of reasons. Uh, one is that you make a lot of decisions as Deputy Attorney General. And second, the ones that appear most controversial are not necessarily the most difficult ones. Uh, and so I really would have a hard time. It's like when people ask me what's the most significant case you handle, and I've been there too long to be able to pick out just one particular case. A lot of the issues are challenging, uh, and the reason that they're challenging is because uh, many of the issues that you don't hear about uh, actually are very challenging because they come up to the deputy's office in a posture where people you respect have contrary views. So hypothetically, if you know, a U.S. attorney and, uh, and the FBI differed over whether to charge a case uh, or if different components of the Department of Justice had different opinions. And so the deputy is often in the position of being a tiebreaker on really important issues, whether to bring a case or not, whether to change a policy or not, uh, how to respond to a congressional inquiry. Uh, and so I can't really just pick out one, but you know, those are the sort of issues that, that typically are, are the most challenging. And uh, you know, one of the benefits of the job is you're typically not making a decision you know, on your own. You've got a, a whole chain of command. So you know, the, the, the components of the Department of Justice that have their views, you'll hear from outside stakeholders, defense attorneys, for example, if they're objecting to uh, an indictment. Uh, and then I'll get input from my staff. So the toughest issues are probably the ones where my immediate staff uh, differs so that there's no consensus uh, in the deputy's office uh, as those are the issues where I'm um, most often in the position where I'm going to make a decision that uh, conflicts with the folks who are working directly with me. Yes, sir. Good afternoon. Troy Brown. There seems to be a lot of confusion regarding the Mueller report. And that's among those of us who have read it. You lawyers have a role, irrespective of our practices, to help non-lawyers uh, digest complex legal issues. Absolutely. And you know, I have a, I know a number of people. Well, I'm sorry, yes, OK. <laughs> Two part question. <laughs> uh, I, I, I don't watch a lot of television, but I do watch some of these uh, TV shows to have a sense of what's out there. And there are a lot of really good, impartial, uh, and competent, highly competent lawyers who go on these shows and explain things in a way that is accurate and reasonable and I think comprehensible and that's really important. Uh, on the other hand, there are folks who go on these TV shows. Some of them are lawyers, but they're really not functioning as lawyers, they're functioning as entertainers. You know, those are the folks who always have the same point of view. And we know as lawyers that if you're being a good lawyer, your opinion's gonna change based on the facts. One side is not always going to be right. Uh, and so those are the folks I respect, you know, the, the commentators who actually are very objective and fair-minded about it. And that's the model I have in mind when I talk about the Maryland lawyer. That, that, that ought to be our approach. And so I think I would encourage all of you to take on that responsibility. Lawyers are respected in the communities, despite the critical stereotypes. You know, people do look up to lawyers. They know uh, that we all go through an extra three years beyond college and that we pass the bar and we're out there you know, practicing in challenging circumstances in courts. And so take opportunities to talk to local groups, schools, you know, public organizations, and spread the word about legal principles. So I think it is important. That really is what I had in mind in, in quoting Lincoln in my remarks. Uh, don't just sit back and obviously we are all offended by some of the stuff we see on TV, but we can do something about it. Uh, because my experience has been that people tend to form their opinions more by what they hear in their communities than by what they're seeing on television. Yes, sir. Yes. In doing your job during the period that you served and when you decided to decide, how did you deal with the constant uh, tweeting of the president? <laughs> okay. So the answer to that is very similar to my last answer. Um, I... First of all, the thing you need to understand, and this is, I, I know it can be confusing from the outside, but the, the president appoints people to run the Department of Justice. He appointed Jeff Sessions and me, now Bill Barr and Jeff Rosen, at the FBI, Chris Ray, and we understand what our responsibilities are. And one of our responsibilities is to make our decisions without regard to partisan politics. Now, there are 
issues on which it's appropriate to consider political views. That's what elections are about. You know, elections are about changing policies, <clears throat> and not everybody's going to be happy with the policy changes. And so we decide, for example, to emphasize immigration enforcement or emphasize civil rights enforcement or corruption enforcement, whatever the issue may be, that has an impact on how we conduct our operations. But when it comes to questions like who we indict, you know, we understand, and the people who work with us and for us understand, that we need to ignore that. So whether it's a tweet from the president or a comment from a congressman or anybody else outside the Department of Justice is expressing their views, we understand our responsibility not to be influenced by that. And so, you know, my view about it was, uh, when the president tweeted about me or about uh, cases in the Department of Justice, that's about communicating with the public, that's about politics, that's not an order. Uh, I didn't I construe a tweet as an order. The president, if he wanted to order us to do something in the Department of Justice, he knew how to do that. And, uh, <laughs> and I can assure you that he knows that I was not responding to his tweets. Yes, ma'am. Should I replicate that? Yeah, good. I, I appreciate the question because, and Brian and, and uh, Doug probably appreciate this. Did, if you ever look at anybody who's just standing in a press conference and not talking, and they're all looking kind of awkward. Uh, because one guy does the talking and the other people just stand there thinking, my job is to stand here. And if I show any emotion, people are going to comment on the emotion. So I'm sympathetic to Chris Christie and some of those other folks who have been criticized for just standing. Because uh, it's hard. That, that one was about 20 minutes. So I want to set that issue aside. Uh, there was nothing in particular going through my mind. Uh, my lack of expression was not an expression. Uh, <laughs> so, so a couple different issues. First of all, uh, you know, I actually was prepared. If people had questions for me, I would have been prepared to step up. But it wasn't my press conference. It was Bill Barr's. And I think there's an important lesson there, and that is, look, there are 115,000 people in the Department of Justice. Ultimately, somebody has to be the final decision maker. And in that case, the Attorney General was the final decision maker. He's been roundly criticized by a lot of folks. Many of you criticize him for it, and that's fine. That's the way the system's supposed to work. That was his decision. And so uh, I have, uh, he, he said that I agree with his decision. I did agree with his decision. Uh, I understand and respect what he did. And I think that uh, what I would encourage you to do, and you know, the passions are still high at the moment, but I, I believe that when people reflect uh, years from now uh, on what Bill Barr did, they'll realize you know, he actually, if you had just thought a year ago, about where we would be now, uh, you would not have expected the president to appoint an attorney general who said, you know what, I'm gonna take that whole report and make as much of it public as I can and let people draw their own conclusions. And so people now take issue with the attorney general giving his opinion about it. Uh, but the bottom line is you all get to make up your own mind about it. And, uh, and I think the folks who criticize him, uh, I think it's unfair because they're not required to defer to Bill Barr. He made one decision, the decision that no prosecution was warranted, and then said, let the American public see it uh, and draw their own conclusions otherwise. And uh, that ultimately is where we are. Yes, ma'am. I have two questions. One of them is a follow-up to what you just said. With um, Mr. Barr's press conference, obviously Robert Mueller came out and disagreed with some of the things he said. So my first question is, do you agree with what he said at the press conference? And the second question is, in your resignation letter, you mentioned some uh, some personal comments about the president. I think something about how you enjoyed being in the room with him, or he was funny. And I just was curious as to why you added those comments to your resignation. Yep. Okay, so that's not exactly what I said, um, <laughs> but uh, but and, and let me address because obviously there's some misconceptions. Um, I don't think Bob Mueller actually did disagree. 
with anything that Bill Barr said. And I, I know why you have that impression. Uh, but I, and I know it's confusing. It's particularly confusing to non-lawyers because what Bob Mueller explained was he, he, he gathered the facts, he reported the facts on both sides, and he determined not to make a recommendation. Uh, and so he didn't make a recommendation. So he actually didn't have any views either way on the issue of whether the facts justified an indictment. And he did try to clarify that even after his press conference, they issued, a, and I wasn't around at the time, uh, I was gone, but uh, they issued a statement afterward from Bob Mueller's office explaining that he did not have any difference of opinion with Bill Barr. What he did have uh, was he had objected early on that he wanted his, his report issued uh, earlier because he thought people would draw a misimpression from the letter that Bill Barr had issued, uh, which as Barr explained wasn't intended to be a summary but was interpreted as a summary. So take that for what it's worth, but at the end of the day, um, my opinion actually doesn't matter because the facts are all out there and everybody's free to draw their own opinion and if you have a firm opinion about it, I'm not under the illusion that I'm gonna be able to change your opinion. But I think if you were to read the whole report, as somebody pointed out, it's, it's a bit long, but if you sit down and read the whole report, uh, the, the special counsel says, you know, we found evidence on both sides uh, and here's the evidence and I recognize that one of the downsides of publicly releasing a report like that is people can second guess you. You know, typically when Doug and Brian and I decline a prosecution, we just say we decline prosecution. Uh, and, and nobody is in position to second guess us because they don't have access to the information. Now you do, and I certainly recognize, and I'm sure the Attorney General recognized, pe people would uh, take issue with it, but, uh, but, but it's out there for people to draw their own conclusions. I know we're out of time. The second issue, my resignation letter. Uh, my resignation letter is kind of like my, my memo about Jim Comey, everything I put in there is true. It's a reflection of my uh, opinions and everybody who's close to me knows that it's true and accurate. Uh, why did I put in that letter that I appreciated the president's courtesy and humor in his conversations with me? Uh, because it's true. Uh, you know, you may have this impression and it may be true. You know, the president uh, is mercurial. I'm sure he, he uh, you know, the stories about him getting angry may be true, but he was always polite to me and I appreciated that. He didn't have to be. Uh, and so that's why I said it. I think we're out of time. Thank you very much. We really appreciate it. Well, thank you very much.